You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andrei. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me I have Dina Lucarimoto. She is the founder and CEO of Phoenix, a leadership and executive coaching company that helps corporations and leaders transform at an accelerated rate. As an advisor, coach, international speaker, and author of Stop Settling, Settle Smart, and the host of the Settle Smart podcast, Dana is evangelizing her new mindset, method, and movement to destroy the myth of work-life balance. Hi, Dana, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Do you want to add anything else about yourself? I think that's good. I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Well, before we start with the questions, I'm really curious. What do you What do you mean by the movement to destroy the myth of work-life balance? What's the myth of the work-life balance? That we can do it all by having it all all at one time, or that we can have it all by doing it all all at one time. You can change those words around any way you want, but it's all a myth. And it sounds exhausting. Burnout. For sure, so is the byproduct, yeah. <laughs> That's a recipe for burnout, sounds like. It's hard to balance. So I guess you're pro being smart in your choices and making the right choices and get as much as you can but without burning out. Exactly. Conscious trade-offs and priorities and making sure they're voluntary whenever humanly possible, which during a time like unprecedented you know, pandemic and racial injustice and economic uncertainty is not the easiest time to consider your voluntary no, choices. It's not. But there, there are choices that people are able to make if they're aware of them. That's really great. And Dana, I'm really looking forward to your stories. So let's get started. What is the biggest leadership success story you witnessed personally? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So I helped a founder grow and sell her business. So she was stuck at around the same revenue and profitability margin for about five years of the 16 years she ran the business when I came in as COO. And as we worked out our rhythm, what she's great at, what I'm great at, her incredible history, lessons learned, my new way of thinking that came in together, we created sort of what we called a zipper effect. And together, we built something pretty remarkable. We did it on a horizon strategy and we horizon built the 36. Strategy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I always use this lingo. I need to remember to explain it because it's sort of a big consulting term. <laughs> I made what I call a three year plan where the first six months was going to be really driving really hard thought leadership, scaling the business, holding the expenditures and really trying to create a place where people knew how to focus. The next 12 to 18 months was meant to be a channel partner strategy and really changing the operation of the business so that it could grow and scale based on an incredible foundation, adding some new ways of working. And then the final tail, we never got there because we sold the company because we doubled in 18 months. Uh, it was fantastic. We were really going to try to do some market making invention type of things that would be IP, that would be based on our software as a service, and that would really change a market, even maybe potentially make a market. But we never got that far because we sold the company. I had a plan. You had a plan. But in your plan, you didn't have the sale of the company in it. It just happened because you were growing so fast. We thought we'd sell it 36 months and we sold at 18. That was a positive, happy surprise. And she's retired. Retired already. She nice. is. I am not, you will notice. <laughs> However, I took my, my piece of equity and I started my own business four years ago. So it was a real win-win. So what did you do to double it in 18 months? Like, that sounds amazing. We picked the right partner. So having a channel strategy and a channel partner that can really accelerate your growth is critical, especially in the type of HR compliance technology sector I was in. And we hadn't had that in her 16 year history. So it's a little bit of invention. It's a little bit of revolution. It's also being a futurist and seeing what's next, what's best, what's around the corner, what's coming. It wasn't so idealistic that it would have taken us forever and just been a cool idea that may or may not have had traction. It had legs. <laughs> that sounds really good. And I'm curious, like, how, how did you get, like, to, for the position of CEO? 
was it like advertising you apply for it or through your network how do you get to bco <laughs> it's a funny story uh i referred her a bunch of other people for the role and she took me to lunch one day i was doing some partner work with her in a bigger global company i was in she was in more niche boutique provider and partner and she took me to lunch and she said I, I found my next CEO. I said, great. Is it this person, this person? I sent over all these resumes. She said, no, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> She's a closer. <laughs> and she got you. And apparently yes. it was the right decision getting you because you really grew the company a lot. It was really um, one plus one equals three. It was the foundation and her vision and her incredible negotiating power and her amazing base and my sort of new way of working and some, some partners that I was able to bring in. It was really the ideal one plus one equals three collaboration model. And when you say your new way of working, what does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question, Andre. So I am not somebody who likes to do the status quo. I really like to push the envelope. I really like to think about the 360 of working with different components. And so the fact that we had no partners, the fact that we weren't a well-known brand, I saw that as a major opportunity. I mean, it's a little, if you think about it, like Netflix and Blockbuster, everyone says, well, Blockbuster was run by a bunch of idiots. That is so not true. Netflix saw digital and streaming coming. They saw the gap and then they went for it, which took out the main brick and mortar competitor. They're all yes. smart, but they can always be smarter, which is my premise. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sometimes a new uh, person comes into an organization and they see things that are obvious for, for an outsider, but they're not obvious for the people that have been looking at the picture for years and years and years. Ob objectivity is everything, really, especially if you are a founder listening to your podcast and you have what I call founder syndrome or founderitis, you're working more in it than on it. And so you have to get out from looking down and you got to come up and look across the market, not just your business. So I work with a lot of founders and it's really true. Objectivity. Yeah, and it's something that you have to, and it's true, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you don't, you have to work not, you also work inside the business, but the more time you can dedicate to working on the business and creating partnerships, it grows even better. You have to take a step back to move it forward in a way. I'm going to borrow you for my executive coaching practice. I think we'd be a good team. I'm all up for it. Sure. That now your good, listeners you know? know too. Mark this <laughs> <Yes>. day. <laughs> this is how deals get done. Live. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Dana, um, now that you share like this amazing success story. I'm curious about what is the biggest leadership failure you had the unfortunate experience of witnessing. Yeah, I'm going to actually talk about what I call the big F in failure and the little F in failure. And this was really okay. tough education that's in my book by my mentor, a gentleman named Ron, who really coached me and mentored me and helped me build my confidence inside of the company we were running together, which we also subsequently sold, by the way pretty successfully for a different founder. And he taught me that I had a lot of fear around risk taking and that in okay. fact, I really wasn't taking enough risks. And he had been a multiple time startup founder an entrepreneur. He had been a big time management consultant. And when he came into our firm to run it and then hired me subsequently, he really taught me a lot about not taking enough risks. So I hit my head a lot in that company experimenting and iterating and trying things. And, and one time I tried to basically reinvent something that was already working pretty well. It was good okay. enough. And he let me do it. And let me tell you, we, we laughed after, but he, he said to me, I promise you this won't work, but I know you're not going to take no for an answer. So go for it and learn. And let me tell you, it, was, it wasn't so great. I tried to reinvent some benchmarking and I'm not even an analyst. I'm more of a strategist. <laughs> and it was like epic failure. People were pissed off at me at work. I had to make friends again with the analysts. Like it was not great, but I learned a lot. That's the first one. Can I tell you a quick second one? Yeah, sure. Okay. This is probably even bigger. I was working internationally building a center of excellence and I had been brought in to sort of lead the charge 80 countries, 
um, really changing the way a big global entrenched pioneer in staffing worked. And I just thought, well, I'm new here and I've got this great passion and it's built on this amazing foundation. You'll notice my pattern here. I like to take foundations <laughs> and then build. But I didn't realize, and this is probably good for us to talk about, that culturally things were going to be very different in each country that I experienced. And I did not give enough credit to what had already been built before. I just kind of came in there charging full steam ahead. Okay. I call it the light switch effect. And I just thought, oh, I could just turn the lights on and everyone in all these countries will just get on board with this, you know, crazy American white lady. It, it doesn't work like that. And I was not smart enough to really understand where everyone was coming from, build a baseline, gauge their uh, appetite for change management. And then of course, through relationships, really slow it down. So that was a tough lesson, but I'm glad I learned it. And we ended up being really successful. I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I like your attitude a lot, Dana. And it's true. It's one of the mistakes you can make, uh, especially as a leader, when you go into a new organization, especially if they have offices all over the places. Even if it's just one office, if you want to revolutionize everything, change it all, uh, you're absolutely right. You need to build a foundation of relationships and see what's going on, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, the culture, the different cultures, especially. And I'm really curious, like, because you turned it around and made it a success. What did you do to bridge the culture divide between all the offices spread around the world? I This is way pre-COVID. I went and visited about 40 different offices across a ton of different countries and provinces. And we did a talking and a listening tour. And we started with listening before we talked. It was supposed to be talking first. That was probably the best thing we could have done. We just listen. What are your challenges? What's working? What's not? Um, we read a book called Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. I'm sorry to that author. It was okay. It, it was a little theoretical. Instead, what I really developed were my coaching skills of rapport building and mirroring. So in the Netherlands, for example, the book said, put your elbows on the table or they won't trust you. And in the U S <laughs> that's being rude. Like you get your hand slapped by your parents growing up if your elbows are on the table. And maybe that's true in the Hague and maybe it's not, I can't really remember at this point, but I mean, it didn't matter. It was whatever the people across the table were doing. I tried to do. And I asked a lot of open-ended questions. That's such great advice. And it sounds like just like we said, like with the elbows on the, on the table or not, there's, those are like superficial things. Um, what really drives, at least in my experience, culture is really deep ideas and variations. They can talk about the same thing, but they have a different perception on it. Then you can get burned with the same terminology and think like, ah, I know what this is about, but it's not because they have a, 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 a new ones that you would not expect for that term to have in another culture. And you're like, why can I, we, see, we use the same words, but it just doesn't fit together. It, it's so funny because I won't say some of the words I made mistakes with, but certain words do not translate well. And I just stepped in it and made all kinds of mistakes. I'm willing to make fun of myself. I don't take myself that seriously. And I've got pretty thick skin. And we would laugh about it, which was good. Sometimes it broke the ice. It was always unintentional. And it was never, you know, deal breaker kinds of things that I said. I will tell you the model that worked, and we talked about this in your pre-show, is 80-20, is Pareto principle. And the reason Pareto worked for us is we called it the fixed yet flexible model. So 80% of what we were trying to push across an entire global organization was going to work. We had tested, we had vetted, we had researched, we had tax, legal, finance, cultural nuances. We really did our homework then. But yes. the 20% was going to have to be in country or even in province. What would work for them was what we were going to adopt. And so that was the flexible piece. And the 80% was the fixed piece. And that was really successful. And that's a good idea to have leave a margin of adaptation for each culture, each different zone. And as you say, like different provinces, they have different cultures. It's because of history and 
people living there and you might say that you understand it even if you live in that country but if you live in another province it's different <laughs> so true and i want to go go back a little to your first uh, story and it's, you say like the big f and the little f what's this all about what is the big f and the little f Ah, uh, you just caught my ADD. I get distracted. Thank you for bringing me back. So the big F is a company fails. You're a startup founder and it fails. It's, you know, an actual big F in failure. You go bankrupt, perhaps, personally, professionally, or both. Big, giant, sweeping failure kinds of things. And then the little Fs are the iteration, the experimentation, the trying things along the way. Oh, okay. And little Fs, they're all okay. But, this, but the big Fs, you should try to avoid them as much as possible. Including when your own children try to distract you when you're on a podcast. That's what you're witnessing. It's not a problem. It's real life happening. It, it is. And she's back from college for a little while. So I'm trying Great. to put her to work. Walk the dogs. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, get her some more serious work. Get her involved in your consulting. <laughs> I don't know about that, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> He's available if you or your listeners are looking. Yes, and I really like your attitude that your mentor had um, about taking big risks and encouraging and even letting you do mistakes that were already done by him and say, like, I know you will not avoid this, so go do make the mistake as fast as possible so we can talk and laugh about it. It's ironic because I've spent 20 years in Silicon Valley and everybody is all about A-B testing and experimentation and agile. And I had attended many agile huddles, which I thought were the coolest thing, right? Highlight, low light, stuck, move things around, give the users what they want before you build it. Like I understood it again, theoretically, the challenge was I hadn't practiced it. And that's, that's like a problem like that everybody has like, in theory, everything sounds so nice, so clear, it's crisp, it's like it's cut, dry, you know exactly what you have to do. But then reality implementation, well, that's not theory anymore. And you right. look at that information, is like, why? Why doesn't it work like in the books? That's why I always try to keep it practical and actionable. That's been my way of operating most of my career. I didn't get an MBA. Most people assume I have one. I don't know why, right, wrong, or indifferent. It just, I had hired so many MBA people that had just graduated or longtime consultants who also had MBAs. And I just didn't feel like I wanted to get more into theory and do other use cases and business cases when I already had so much experience and exposure. I took a lot of risks in my career. It's funny, I didn't take as many risks inside of those jobs, but I did take the opportunity to move out, to move up whenever you know I was headhunted out or whenever the opportunity struck, I took it. That was my way of really stretching myself. You have the, I, I love the, how you phrase like the concept, move out to move up. Do you find like it's easier to advance in your career by moving out? For me as a woman in Silicon Valley in particular, yes. I hit my head a lot and I just didn't want to get stuck. And I had made that mistake. At the first position I had right out of university, I don't know that I stayed too long, but I was getting kind of itchy to make a move and I was getting a little bit bitter. And that is not a good time to look when you're getting angry with your own organization. So, you know, it's always a good time to look when you don't have to. And when opportunity strikes, I suggest that you take it as long as it is an upward mobility, unless you are choosing something lateral, or maybe you're choosing a step back and you want to work a little bit less because of what's happening in your total complete life, that's okay too. It just needs to be a conscious choice. And then I'm really curious about moving up. Does, does moving up always come with a salary bump? No. And in, in particular for you equity chasers, it, it can come with a major salary hit. You have to be in a position to afford it literally. And it's beyond even just what you can afford. It is emotional. Compensation is emotional. I, I spent 23 years in staffing. It is emotional. So you really got to get right with how you're willing to get paid in a total 
compensation way. What's the variable? What's the equity? Is the equity even potentially real? You have to really think that through in all of that 360. And so it's something that I also like to tell people, look, if you want to advance, things like going to management or a more premium position, sometimes you're going to make less money in the premium position, especially if it's your first one that you're going to, to get because the people are taking a gamble on you, so they're not going to pay you that much. They want you to prove yourself after you have a track record. That's something else. That is so true. I, I also, I don't know if you agree with this. I see a lot of executives get anxious about top salespeople making more than them. Um, so they sales get, pays. <laughs> exactly. I, I don't understand why, because they bring in the money to make money. And I've heard horror stories about salespeople that were actually making so much that the owner said, I cannot make all this money. I'm not going to pay your commissions. And then they were dissatisfied when the sales start slumping. So like, like it's a no-brainer. You didn't fulfill your end of the bargain. Why should they fulfill their end of the bargain? I am with you. You know, it's also interesting when I think about top performers, especially salespeople and business development people, they don't always make the greatest people leaders. Let's face it. Many of them are phenomenal at individual contribution. And then companies just say, okay, great. You're promoted. Here's a team of 50. And then they start failing, which really affects them and their performance and the way they feel about themselves inside and outside of work. So you know, I really value the top performers who are in sales and business development. And if they're an individual contributor, leave them alone. Let them make their money. We, we all win. Exactly. And it also goes like for software developers. Uh, sometimes they get promoted to a more managerial role and they really don't like it and they're not good at it. And they used to, they used to get along with their colleagues fine and then they're their bosses and every, everybody is, is not fine anymore inside the team. Yeah, I've experienced that with CTOs in the past in my own organizations. And you're right. It's it's interesting. Although I knew enough to help develop them along the way so they had a fair shot to be successful. Good, good. Because something that happens, especially somebody that gets a CTO, now they feel that because they have the position, they can impose their own ideas about how software should be done and built instead of having the conversation, which is thrilling as a software developer to have those conversations and mind challenges over a beer about what's the best approach. But then when you are the boss, you go like, I'm going to build it right. I'll make it my way. And you don't accept any of the conversations anymore. Which... Although I do find that having the tech chops is critical as well. So we're always looking yes. for this needle in a haystack, like someone amazing with people and who can also program and also lead a team and also be at the cutting or bleeding edge of technology. Like we want everything in one person. It's not always possible. Well, now my job descriptions, they look more like they're hiring a team, not a person. <laughs> that's, that's a new trend. Yes. Yes, it's a good trend. This is a good trend because it forces you to stretch. And yes. with that in mind, Dina, what is your leadership philosophy? This one's simple, and I really mean it. People follow what you do, not what you say. Uh, so they're always looking at you and seeing what you're doing. And it's, it's, it's something that I had like previous conversations about it. And it's so true. And the more I discuss, I think about it and I discuss it, it's true. It's you lead by example, you don't lead by telling. You know, the, I guess the adage is walk the walk and talk the talk. The talk is cheap. It, it really is. It's really the walking part. And management by walking around virtually or live is old school. It's basic and it's something I've done since I was in my early 20s. I'm in my early 50s. It also works with kids if you can discipline yourself. I'm mostly talking to me now. You can discipline yourself it's enough. Hard, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, we. I hear myself, right? I'm nagging and I'm saying you should and you should. And what I need to do is just do it and have them watch. And all of a sudden they'll start you know, replicating. And I've seen it. It's just, I got to check myself. It's hard. It is hard. And I just think, you know, here in Romania, we have a saying, 
don't do what the priest does, do what the priest says. <laughs> so it's like the reverse of it. I have a philosophy. That you can cut this if you don't like it. Otherwise, this is kind of interesting. In my book, That's and nice. just in my practice, I don't like the golden rule because the golden rule says do unto others as they'd have done unto them. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes. See, I'm doing my platinum rule. I like the platinum rule. Do it unto others as they'd have done unto them, not do unto others as you would have done unto you. Because the challenge with you unto you is that that story I told earlier about just going into all these countries, guns ablazing, like, let's just get this done. We're one team. And they're looking at me like, do you understand what you're asking us to do? You need to understand us first. First, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. And so I've always used the platinum rule, which is find out what people want and if humanly possible, give it to them. Don't just push what you want on to others. It just is not going to work. Oh, it never works. And I, for one, wouldn't appreciate somebody coming saying like, this is how you should do it because it works for me and it will work for you. Uh, not really because I also have some different preferences or a different background. It does not apply. Uh, you can cherry pick stuff from another person that you can uh, you can take and assimilate and also transform, but no, nah, don't don't. <laughs> and in trying to copy yourself is not good. It's not good at all. It makes for a boring world. That's that's my <laughs> opinion about it. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> and I like your platinum rule. It's really good, and it's something that we should encourage more because it truly brings like the whole world together by you get to accept people as they are. And it's something we need now. It, it, uh, it appears. You probably can't see this. I'm wearing my consciously unbiased shirt today. My client has a business that started as t-shirts and it's turned into training and development to become more aware that we have bias and then how to become more conscious of those biases and then how to work yourself into understanding others, which again, if you just slow down and ask questions and listen, like what you do on this podcast, we can really learn from each other and we can usually find a middle. We don't always have to pull someone to our way of thinking or give up what we think and just jump over to their side. Like there is a middle. We just have to work to, to create that middle. And then would you have like some tips on how to ask questions and listen well? It's called Socratic questioning and attorneys do this beautifully. Let me simplify. It is the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Any question starting with those six words, you're on your way as long as it's open-ended and you're not married to the answer. Because if you're married to the answer, <laughs> you're not being a good questioner and you're not being a good listener. Uh, another person who really influenced my life and I worked with and he's since passed away. He told me you only have two eyes, two ears and one mouth for a reason. So listen more, watch what's happening more. T again, talk less. And I would be really curious what we have like in a meeting where we have people that abide for this rule. You have two ears, one mouth using that proportion. I guess 30% of the time will not get said anything in that meeting. <laughs> I coach a lot of executives on this concept. It takes time. It, takes it sure time. takes time. And there's always some person that is starved to let stuff off their chest, especially uh, if you get an executive or someone that is used to asking questions and listening all the time. When it gets their turn to, <laughs> to talk, well... You strap in, get a cup of coffee, and you'll get so much information. <laughs> uh, you're taking me back. Memories of the boardroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. And since uh, you say like memories of the boardroom, for aspiring leaders who want to reach the level of the boardroom, what are your top three leadership tips you would have for them? Sure. This is such a great question. First and foremost, I, I, I just have to reiterate, you, you got you to gotta show up and you got to lead by example because people also believe what you do way more than what you say. So really, really build your portfolio, build your body of work and make sure you can prove that body of work 
in three ways. It has to be quantifiable. It has to be qualified. And a couple of anecdotal use cases and stories goes a long way. It's, again, a 360 of building almost your own brand. I coach a CEO of a large airport, and she says, I am the airport. I am the product. She really is a remarkable person and leader and wife and mother and, and, and. She sits on a bunch of boards. I mean, she's really at the top of her game. Went to MIT for her MBA. She's just incredible. I learn a lot from her about how she operates, believing she's an extension of that airport as the product. We all have to think of ourselves as a product. And then you really take care of the, the product if you think you are part of the product. If you see it going dirty or stuff not going correctly, you take action and make sure it goes it goes well. If not exactly. And tip number two and three. Sure. So number two is this is really important. Get in people's heads. Get to know them. And especially if you're all working remote, you can notice they have laundry sitting behind them or kids running around or a dog on their lap. Don't just pretend their lives don't exist and that you're only going to focus on work and that there's this divide between work and life. Life is the wrapper. Work is just a subset. It may be a giant subset, a small subset, an in and out subset. Life is the wrapper and the other facets of life are critical for you to understand about that person. If you want to really work well together, get to know them, inspire them. And so you have career, family, friendships, community, and well-being. Make sure you're a complete leader and that you're taking care of people completely, which allows them to show up as their authentic selves. I know that sounds a little preachy, but I'm really clear on that. And when you say like, take care of people completely do you recommend like having discussions with them and not just talk business and their careers but also talk like their personal goals what they want to achieve in on a family life and then social life and all this and try to align them all together 100 percent. and you will be able to take that all the way to your bottom line You will see more sustainability, Um, more return on investment, more profitability, more longevity. People are more promotable and engaged. You'll see it in loyalty metrics and measures. This is a quantifiable thing. It is not just soft. People will always say to me, well, you're so all about EQ. And I'm really only partially about EQ. Like your emotional intelligence is a huge component of being a leader. You, you've got to also have results. And so that's probably my third tip is results count. And I'll, I'll give you my favorite quote. It is not mine. And I don't know who said it, but it's brilliant. It is ideation without execution is hallucination. <laughs> that is awesome. And it's true. You can have a lot of ideas. And you hear about people that I had that idea before it was created or for a product. So look, if you didn't take the action, you didn't risk on it and risk the failure that was attached to the proposition, you should not complain now. <laughs> that you. Hello, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. And Dana, what is the book that had the most profound impact on you? Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Dare to Lead. Why? I never realized that being vulnerable was courageous. And in fact, I hid my vulnerability. I was a single mom for 11 years in the, in the midst of working really hard and being a provider and trying to keep my, you know what, together. And I didn't realize it was okay to be vulnerable. I was not even really my full self because of things that Brene calls blame and shame. And some of that had to do with being a working mom. I had guilt at home, not being with the kids enough. I had guilt at work, not being able to work 90 hours a week. I mean, that book was revolutionary for me. Unfortunately, it came a little late. Sorry, Brene, you could have been (laughs) quicker. Uh, Because when I was really in the throes of early single motherhood, I was pretty lost of how to juggle And that's where this whole premise for my book came, right? You cannot do it all, all at one time in order to have it all and be your all. 
that is not true because doing it all at one time is going to make you sick. In my case, it certainly did. Yes. And that's one of the major drawbacks. If you get burned out, it also manifests manifest itself physically. It's not good. And I'm really curious, Dina, how, um, when you say like being, how did it change your career path and what you achieved by being vulnerable? I stopped hiding, and it's not a great analogy in the time of pandemic, but I stopped wearing so many masks at work. I was superwoman and type A workaholic, and no one saw me upset ever, yet I was always so interested in people and humanity and a relator. So people would tell me their stories. I mean, I would coach all the time at work because people felt comfortable and they knew I was trustworthy, and I was genuinely curious about them. However, I wasn't really sharing myself. And at one point, I'll tell you, this is probably the pivotal moment. I had an employee come up to me after my divorce and he said, you know, you only missed a day of work. You are a machine. And that light bulb oh. went off and it's, it, it wasn't a good thing. I'm not a machine and that is not sustainable. And it's not, if I could go back in time, how I would operate. I would have taken more time off. I would have been kinder to myself. I would have told the team, you're all fantastic. You need to step up so I can step back, like have my back. I always have yes. yours. So I would have done that differently. I don't really do regret. I kind of gave that up for what I call Jewish <laughs> Lent, but I, I just, I don't do regret or guilt really anymore. I'm really working on not using those things, their weapons and manipulative. So I really wouldn't, you know, beat myself up that I didn't do it. However, I would go back and do it differently because I would have been where I am now in my early fifties, probably in my mid forties, early forties, oh, I could have really nice. accelerated my own transformation. And that's such a powerful tip because everybody that gets like in a management leadership position, they feel like they have to be perfect now. No more messing up. They have to project this image that it's not, they have no flaws, no vulnerabilities, nothing, which is one is really hard to do all the time. And two, everybody knows it's not true. Nobody has a perfect life. So they, you, you're a little hurting yourself because you're not authentic with the other people. So you don't get to build strong relationships that fast due to that. It's a hundred percent true what you just said. And I've experienced it over and over and over. And as an exec coach, I experience it with my clients all the time. They're learning the lesson through my own mistakes. We teach what we most need to learn. That's the coaching promise. <laughs> uh, so basically when you're coaching, you get to coach yourself more and look at the younger yes, version well, of the city. Yes. Or as my younger 16 year old daughter would say, I am finally practicing what I preach. So there we are back to that. People follow what you do, not just what you say. Okay. And Dana, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Everything is settle smarter. We're already smart. We can always be smarter. So Instagram, we're posting daily tips, tricks, tools, traps to avoid, and it's at Settle Smarter. Same with Twitter, LinkedIn. You can find me at Dana Look Arimoto, Settle Smarter, and my website is SettleSmarter.com. And the podcast, yeah. Settle Smarter. <laughs> That's great. And the book, is it on Amazon or all the other platforms? Yeah, it's on yeah. Amazon. And the podcast is on all the places that you would listen to your podcast. It's really new and it's been a lot of fun and really enlightening getting guests to come on something tells me you're next oh it will be my pleasure to come on the show uh i highly encourage everybody listening here to go check out dana's website get her book and listen to her show you heard she's amazing you're going to learn a lot thank you so much dana for coming on the show thank you it's been a pleasure bye That was today's episode. Tune in daily. Rate, like, subscribe and share please. Oh, you can find further info and materials in the show notes on techyleadership.com, including links to the guest book recommendations.